Hello. 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 Good evening. It's good to see everyone here uh, as we continue to prepare for, for Easter. Uh, yeah, welcome. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, would you uh, join me in prayer? Uh, Father, first again, and as always, thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, thank you for, uh, for making us for making a way for us to be reconciled to you through the redemptive work of your son Jesus. Thank you for loving us no matter what. Uh, thank you for your Holy Spirit that enables us to believe. Thank you for your word, for the word made flesh. Uh, Father, for the freedom that we enjoy in this place and time to, to worship you without, without fear or, or even consideration of, uh, of persecution. Um, let us not take it take that for granted. So, help us to remember to maintain a spirit of forgiveness for everyone all the time. And uh, pray that the, the things we do here tonight will be pleasing to you and uplifting for each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And would you, uh, everybody got a little handout with some words in it? Play it. Sing uh, All Creatures of Our God and King. of our God and King, lift up your voice and let us sing, oh praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with soft
This is Romans 5, verse 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this great grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, that endurance produces character, and that character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, we were, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Can we pray with me? Lord God, we come to you tonight, and we pray for you to be with us in the times that we feel lost, or without direction, or the times that we feel that you've left us. God, tonight we confess the times that we've been angry with you, when we failed to see your plan, when we doubted you and betrayed you. We pray that you will be with us in those times and remind us that you have never left us and will never leave us. That when we thirst for you, you will provide. And that all we ever need to do to find your love is to walk to you in faith and drink. Amen. <coughs> In Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His cornerstone, his solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love. Yeah. 
maybe never do this. I apologize if you've never done this before. It's weird. But if you, so we kind of get the concept that Jesus was pre betrayed by people back then, and not just a lot of people, but the people from the places where he came from, like his people. I right? think, well, that was silly of them to do that. But I think the reality is that if, if one could think about being there, with a couple thousand years of perspective, it's easy to think, you know, I, would, I saw that stuff and heard that stuff. I wouldn't have. I don't know what I would have done, but I wouldn't have told him to kill him. And I just wouldn't have done that. And I, I think that's wrong. I think I probably would have. I don't know. And so my, my, my challenge or my, my thought here is, where would you have been? And I don't. I think that no matter where you you can place yourself in in that space and time, you would have you would have not stood up for this thing that that again with with all this perspective we have come to, to value you know priceless thing. Uh, but I think in the moment, I, I, I'm pretty sure I would have I would have done exactly what the what the masses did. And so and that's a that's a dirty little thought, and it's and it's not a, it's not a, it's not a pleasant thought, but it's in times like I think it's an important thought, and 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 if you can get there, and that troubles you, it's it's a good time to remember uh, the promises that God has also made to us uh, in Scripture. So, and that's where we're going now. We're going to sing about uh, the promises of God and and His faithfulness. So, yeah. So. That was in my head, and I wanted it to not be there anymore. <laughs>
everybody for coming tonight like I said uh, right off the bat I want to just get a few things out of the way in case you didn't know I am not Adam okay, okay? I've never given a sermon before so I'm pretty nervous we didn't know that till now. right well, now you have these huge expectations but I think with a little bit of grace from you guys and a whole lot of grace from God we'll get through it just fine so bear with me if I stumble Shane's over there mean mugging me so that's not gonna help at all but I'll try to do my best. There's a few things that are very different for me and Adam. First off, I don't have a man bun. Um, <laughs> partly because I don't have the hair for it, but mostly because I would never do that to you guys. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not going to make you stare at my feet the whole time I preach at you. I have shoes on like a big kid. <laughs> There are some things that are the same, though. Uh, while I don't look like white Jesus, I do look a little bit more like what Jesus probably looked like. My middle name is Adam. And much like Adam, I have a deep and passionate love for this church and what we're trying to do in Knoxville. And that's why he got a wretch like me to come up here and give a sermon to you guys today. So far, uh, through Lent, we've been studying Exodus. And uh, last week, we heard Adam give us the account of when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and out of their bondage. And that story has always just been really awesome to me. You know, um, he's, Moses comes and leads his people out of Egypt, and then when they get to safety, God tells them to turn around. Because that's not the direction or the path that he wanted them to take. So they turn around and walk back towards the armies that were marching towards them. Very much into the belly of the beast where they were all ready to safety. Then they get stuck between that army and the sea. With no way to cross it. 
seemed like a dire situation. Yet here comes God, and he parts the sea so that his people can walk through on dry land. And that dry land part always stuck out to me because it's not just that he parted the waters, which is a huge feat in its own, but if it was dry land, that means that he took every little particle of water out of that seabed so that they weren't having to tronce through mud and that their wheels on the chariots weren't getting stuck. And for some reason, that just stands out to me. That's crazy. I mean, I, we can't even do that with technology we have today, but God did it at his will. And then I think of how intimidating it must have been to walk through that canyon of water. Like, if you just really stop and think about it for a moment, about what it must have looked like, sounded like, to walk through that valley and see these huge pulsing walls of water on either side of you. That had to be horrifying. Then you get to the other side and you look back through where you came and there's an army of the bad guys coming for you. What do we do now? Then you watch that valley close on the people that would do you great harm. And I can't help but think how surreal it must have been as they stood there and watched those chariots and those pieces of armor and those bodies float to the surface. If that's not awe-inspiring to you, then I don't know whatever it could be. But that's not where the story ended. So today, we're reading from uh, Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. All of the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water there for people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted for water. And their people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there at the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I don't know if any of you guys have ever been stranded in the desert, but let me assure you, it is not a good time. I was once stranded in the desert uh, with my mom on one of our cross country trips. We used to drive from Tennessee to California and back uh, during the summer as a fun road trip and vacation. One year we decided to take the scenic route the whole way there. And in the middle of the desert of Arizona, on some backcountry road that was hardly ever traveled, our alternator went out. We hadn't seen a sign of civilization for two hours on this road. And now here we are stuck in 110 degree weather in the middle of the Arizona desert with nothing but sand as far as you could possibly see. In the car with us, we had a banana, a can of Pepsi, and one and a half bottles of water. And that was it. We sat there for about two and a half hours, hoping somebody would come by and didn't see a single car, nothing. I mean, Wiley Coyote wasn't even out there. So we concluded that our best bet would be to wait until sunset and walk in the direction that we were headed, because there was nothing for two hours behind us. God, I hope that there's something in front of us. So 
So we sat and we waited. The sun started to set. And just as we were about to set off, my mom decided, no, we're going we're gonna to wait longer. I really didn't understand it at the moment, whether it was faith or fear that led that decision. But as we prayed, she decided to wait. And while she tried her best to hide it, I could tell that she was scared. She was afraid that her and her son were going to die in this desert because she made the choice to set out into the desert completely unprepared. Now what's going to happen? I would imagine that's how the Israelites felt in that moment. They followed God. They went out into the desert. And now here we are, God in the desert with no water. Why would you bring us here just to kill us? While we were slaves in Egypt, at least we had food and drink. And now here we are with our freedom, but what's that going to get us? Dead in the desert. Why would you do this to us, God? Why would you lead us here just to die? Hindsight is twenty twenty, And like Roger said, it's easy with all of this context and knowing the whole story to say, well, I wouldn't have questioned God like that. I mean, they just saw Seahart. Why would they be questioning him? It's really easy to say that. But it's not fair to say that. Because we do the same thing they did almost every day. At least I know I do. There's many times when God asks us to be brave and to be great. He asks us to take these huge leaps of faith when we don't see what's below us, but he asks us to trust him that he'll be there to catch us. Many, many times we aren't brave enough to do that. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we take that leap and we don't quite land exactly where we thought we would. It's not as comfortable there as we hoped. It's not exactly what we had in mind. It's not quite as prosperous as we hoped it would be. And we start to question him, God, why? Why did you have me do this? Why did you have me take this jump only to leave me here to die in the desert? Or in this job that I don't like? Or in this toxic relationship I can't seem to get out of? Or in this pit of despair we find ourselves in dealing with the loss of a loved one? Why would you bring me here just to leave me here. And that's where Moses was. Moses saw his people failing. And I'm sure he struggled to understand it. In fact, we know he did because he called out to the Lord, God, what do I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. I can't imagine his frustrations in that moment. I've brought ten plagues upon Pharaoh so that he would be moved to let you go. The very embodiment of God followed us through the desert with this cloud. I parted a sea, and yet now that you're thirsty, you're questioning God, and you're ready to bury me up to my waist in the sand and throw rocks at me until I'm dead. Can you imagine that? How frustrated would you be? How angry would you be? Yeah, yeah, that's something. So then he goes to God, he cries to God, what, what shall I do? And God says, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I don't know a better way to put it, but that is gangster. You've got thousands, literally thousands of people outside your door ready to kill you. And you just got to just go get your dudes and your staff and walk right past them. And they won't do a thing. And that's brave. That's faith. Do we have that much faith? Most of the time I do. 
but Moses did. And behold, I will stand before you there at the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Man, like I said, that's, that's just so gangster. And I love this part of the story, not just for the gangster status of Moses, but because of the hidden message in there. When everything seems lost and at its most dire, when the angry mob is at your door and you don't feel like you have a way out, when everything has gone wrong and everything's stacked against you and you feel like God has left you, he hasn't left you. It's that you left him and your faith in his promise somewhere along your journey through that desert of sin. But all is not lost there because all you have to do in those moments is boldly walk to him in faith and you will drink. You will drink the blood of Christ that was spilled for you, for your glory, for your forgiveness, and for our victory. That's just beautiful. We can never be too far from him. Because no matter where we turn, there he is, just waiting for us to boldly walk to him so we may drink. I assure you guys that while that's hard to do, that's the only thing that's going to chase away that angry mob in your heart. Whether it's a literal angry mob outside your door or an angry mob of doubt in yourself, in your faith, in your God. The only thing that's going to get you through that is walking to him boldly in faith so that he may provide for you. Because when we thirst, he provides. And that's his promise. And in those dire times, it will always be true. Some of you might be wondering how my story with my mom and I in the desert ended. Like I said, right at sunset, she decided we were going to wait. And I did not agree with that plan because I felt like the longer we sit here, the less water we have, the more likely we are to die out there of exposure. Come on, what are you, what are you doing? We have to get moving. But she was the boss of me, so we waited. And after sitting in that car for at least an hour, as it got darker, and darker and darker in that desert. I don't know if you've ever been in the desert at night. It gets dark. I mean, really dark. And I just kept thinking, God, we're going to get out there. We're going to get ate by coyotes, man. We don't have a gun. We don't have a flashlight. We have a we have 30 ounces of water, my pocket knife, and a banana. Like, we need to get moving. Yet, out of nowhere, we saw headlights behind. So my mom, Jessica, met her. She was not a small lady. Jumps out of the car and just frantically waving her arms. And got the car to stop. And it was a man with his wife and a son and a daughter in a station wagon. <coughs> wood panels the whole, the whole nine yards. The perfect station wagon. My mom told him about how we had broken down. And he invites us to get into the car. And he would take us to the closest town. Which was about a 30 minute drive in the direction we were heading doing the math at home, that's about 60 miles. 60 miles on foot with an out-of-shape mom and 30 ounces of water and a banana. Those aren't good odds. So this man took us into the nearest town, which because it was a hole-in-the-wall town and in the middle of the desert, had a 24-hour truck stop that also had a mechanic bay. And thank the Lord above, they had an alternator that would fit our car. So this man then goes into the shop and bought the tool he would need to put it on, took us back to the car, and under the light of his headlights, put that alternator on, charged our battery, and followed us back in town to make sure we'd be okay. In that moment, I saw God send a man to strike a stone for us. Jesus has done this for me countless times in my life because I'm stupid and I'm broken and I constantly put myself in horrible positions. And time after time after time, 
Jesus comes through for me. I think of the time when I was saved, the first time that I asked Christ to come into my life and he answered. And while a sea was imparted in that moment, I felt the weight of those thousands of people crossing on dry land on my heart. Yet times after that, I questioned it. When things were at their most dire, I challenged him, why would you bring me here? But time after time, Jesus has let me walk to him and drink. How many times in your life have you felt desperate? Like you couldn't go on? How many times were you heartbroken and wondered where he, where along the line did you leave? Let me assure you guys, he didn't. And he's waiting for you at that rock. And all you have to do is walk to it, strike it, and drink. I promise. Will you guys pray with me? Lord God, we come to you today so thankful that even though we fail a million times, you're there for us a million and one. No matter how we fall short of your glory, your grace, and forgiveness and love is enough to bring us up to where we should be. Lord, help us to remember that in the darkest of times, you are with us. You will never forsake us. You will never leave us alone in that desert. And you will always be that drink that we so desperately need. In your name, we come to you with love, appreciation, and such reverence. Amen. Should have one song left on there. We haven't touched it. Probably maybe a new song for some of you, uh, but it's 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 easy and it's fun and it's and it's, and it's I think it's pretty wonderful. Um, Thank you. 
Okay, with that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. You did awesome. <laughs> <laughs> knocked her out, so that's a good sign. <laughs> Adam always puts her in. There was a, a soothing message for her. Yeah, she was she was all good. Well, Adam always puts her to sleep, so she also, I mean, she's out now, so. <laughs> you did drop her little church boat, so that's probably a good thing, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Not bad. I don't know. Right, I guess we'll see. Pretty <laughs> rough.